All right. So talks of climate weave in and out of our daily lives from global politics to the clothes we wear and how we spend our money. So how can we make sense of what we each do to contribute to the future of our planet? That's why my guest this week is Elizabeth Landau, the co-founder and COO at Green Portfolio, a climate fintech startup whose goal is to provide every investor, you, me, everyone else, with the means to measure and manage the climate impact of their money. I'm so excited for this conversation because we haven't hit climate yet too much in Make Sense. So, but first, welcome to this week's episode of Make Sense. It's a video podcast that simplifies complex issues, and there are a lot of them at the intersection of tech and people. So whether you're totally hyped on artificial intelligence and ready for the robot takeover, or you want to crawl into a cave after deleting all of your social media accounts, I feel you. I'm here with my guests to help make sense of what's going on so you can design yourself into the future. Of course, my name is Lindsay Tavis. I'm a product market fit strategist and innovation advisor. I've just always been obsessed with designing technology for people, and that's why I make sense is here. So let's get started. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm feeling great. Thanks for having yeah. me. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. I love recording these. I look forward to it each <laughs> week because it's just a time to talk with intelligent people about intelligent things. So I'm so glad you're here. Awesome. And to be considered intelligent. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure you feel great. Right. <laughs> so it's always, always nice to hear. <laughs> so let's start with our first segment. Everyone should be getting used to this one. It's an exciting way to warm up uh, with my guest, Crystal Ball. What does the future hold? Let's pull out those magic eight balls and VG boards. This is where I call out interesting predictions for this year. And the experts, my guests, just tell us their hot take. So how this works is I'm going to do this rapid fire and Elizabeth, I want you to say something like, yes, I want that to happen or no, please no. And and at the end, we'll uh, dive into some deeper topics. Okay. So big trend for 2023 is sustainability in travel. So France banned flights between destinations that could take two and a half hours or less on the train. So do we need to stop flying? I think I'm here for that. I mean, <laughs> two, and a half, two and a half hours, if you think about it, like going to your train station to get on the train versus having to go through security at an airport, wait, probably get delayed, get to the next airport, have to find your rental car <laughs> or motor transportation. Like, honestly, probably a win-win for climate and also like your time savings. Yeah. You're not saving, you're not saving that much time uh, flying from, hey, I'm in Philadelphia to Newark, right? There's, there's really no need to, to do anything like that or Philadelphia to DC, we have, we have the Amtrak. So do you think we could um, like see that in the US or is this really like a European thing? So I do think it can happen here. I do think it's going to be a little while because we know that Europe always is leader on anything climate or like efficiency related. But, you know, having been someone who's, you know, trying to take a flight from, you know, Boston back down to New York and been delayed like numerous times, like would have been a lot easier just to get on the train. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I am a huge proponent of train travel. I've been taking the train um, since I was a kid from the Philadelphia suburbs to New York and all over. So I, I hope for this. All right. So lab based meats will hit more plates. Okay. So this isn't like the like Beyond Burger or Impossible Meats, but actually lab-based meats. So we have yet to see cell cultured cutlets in the grocery aisle. Do you think we are going to see those in the grocery aisle by the end of this year? Probably not by the end of this year, um, but I do think they'd be coming next year. And I think okay. the the big thing on this is just going to be getting people familiarized with it. Um, and also making sure that they understand, you know, pros and cons, right? I mean, we know that animal harm and cruelty in terms of how we raise animals for for consumption, as well as like the methane that's yeah. produced from cows, like we know that's not great. Um, but it will take a little time, I think, for people to feel like this is a healthy, safe, and cool thing to do. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Do you think, um, yeah. Do you think people are going to, to f want to see, I guess, uh, more proof that there's nothing kind of toxic or bad about lab-based meats? Yeah. I think it's just like, it's just something very different, right? Than what everyone's accustomed to, but you know, I thought you were going to use a pun like, oh, how the sausage is made. But um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, kind of, sausages and hot dogs are pretty gross, right? Pretty disgusting. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you do some comparisons, like definitely going to be, I think, feeling better about something that's lab based. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is this like, I hope this is like, may maybe this is like a compromise, right? Like you don't have to give up beef, right? But maybe yeah. we can think differently about where beef comes from. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for it. It's just yeah. people are going to have to be willing to like kind of take the leap. And one thing that I think is interesting, and I know this is supposed to be rapid fire, so I'm taking this off course, but actually a friend of mine, uh, someone I met uh, while I was traveling back in 2010, he actually has a company in Israel that 3D prints lab meat. So mm -hmm. 3D printers are known for prototyping things. And we, because we might be prototyping like a, a pair of sunglasses or a watch or a, a part that goes into an airplane, uh, most 3D printers are very exact. But as we move into lab grown meat, we don't want like a very exact looking T-bone and to produce 50,000 of those because the creep factor of going to the butcher and picking out like from a bunch of T-bones that look exactly the same, it, it feels unnatural. Yeah. So he's yeah. working on a 3D printer that is like globular enough to like create meat cutlets that look more natural. Yeah, Which is that's, like, that's a great example of how you have to adapt technology, like, to your market, right? Um, right, to the consumer taste. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty novel. <laughs> cool. All right, so switching a little bit, um, age of the tech CEO hero will come to an end in 2023. That's an interesting one. I think think if you're talking about the big players, yes. But I do think Elon, innovation. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the early thousands that have now kind of like crept in, right? Like, and have continued their, their streak. I think they're coming to an end. Um, but that being said, like innovation is always, I feel like, integrated with tech. Um, so I think you're just going to see a new wave of players that are going to become the front runners. And I'm also hoping for a bit more diversity in that yeah. uh, world, not just um, white and male. Yeah. I was going to say as a female founder, how does the like glorification of startup CEOs help or hurt you in your own development? Um, I mean... I've always worked in male dominated industries. So that hasn't really been something I feel like that's really changed how I look at things for myself. Um, but yeah, I don't think it'd be bad to have some, some more women and who are being praised and, and glorified the same way, you know, a man in a black hoodie has been over the years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Or a turtleneck. Right. Yeah. Okay. So switching to finance, some two ha ha headlines. So one trend is that finances will become boring again. Like timeless money principles will win out. This could go in a bunch of different directions. Like did finances ever become like really not boring in the past few years? Uh, what do you think? I mean, I don't think they're going to become boring per se again. I think with you know, younger generations, like our, our millennial like group of people plus Gen Z, I think there's this world where now finance can be integrated into like different things we're doing, um, more gamified experience, like more interactive. I mean, I would argue that what happened, you know, with, you know, GameStop and Robinhood and whatnot, like definitely not boring. Right. <laughs> um, not very, boring. 
Yeah, very, uh, very interesting from that perspective. And then in my world, like, you know, layering in um, impact, so social or environmental impact into how you align your finances to that, I think just makes this something that can be a world that's more integrated into what you think about rather than just something like that's in spreadsheets or you talk to someone like at a bank about. Yeah, I wonder if like, Part of this is about timeless money principles, you know, steadily putting money into retirement, steadily putting money into, you know, the market and standard financial vehicles, diversifying your portfolio. All of those things will probably always kind of be a standard. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of like a tape, like a table stakes part of finance, right? Like you want to make sure that you are financially secure for your future. And then, you know, that gives you then flexibility to do fun things. And, you know, a a diversified portfolio is always important because you never know what's going to happen. So like, those are all, I think, more like basic, like rules of the game. Um, And I think, but I think there's ways that you can uh, make the game more fun. Yeah, I think so too. And useful. And we'll talk about that. And, and so specifically for green portfolio, you're, you do straddle climate tech as well as fintech. And one of the trends for the world of fintech is that fintech will go through a rapid regeneration. So maybe the economy is pressuring fintech companies to adapt, uh, potentially going after enterprise clients, not just consumers. How are consumers using fintech to help navigate this economy this year? It's a good question. I mean, fintech, I feel like, is just so integrated into all the apps and things that we use today. You don't even think about when you're using it, right? Yeah, right. Like um, Venmo, Venmo. Venmo, Square. You're out doing everything and you tap your phone like fintech. Um, okay, right. Yeah, which is, you know, so it's, it's completely integrated. I think the, how like, consumers are going to be using fintech moving forward is just like you don't even want to know it's there like it's just making your life so much easier in terms of either how you're spending how you're sharing expenses with like a partner or your friends um how you can look at like your subscriptions um Mm -hmm. millennials and gen z have to pay the most per month in subscriptions subscriptions right Uh, so understanding where those are is pretty important uh, yeah. and what you're paying for. So, uh, I just think that there's like, fintech's just going to become something that you don't even think about because it's integrated into everything you do. Right. I think probably one of the things I'm thinking about, for instance, is, uh, Rakuten, which used to be Ebates, right? So it's a, a large directory of places you can shop online and in person. And if you go from their directory to the website, you can get some cash back, but now they have Google Chrome plugins. So it literally just comes up while you're shopping. And I love one that, you know, gave me a climate profile of every store that I'm shopping on. And I'm sure someone is working on something like that. So maybe we're saying that, you know, finances, okay, the fundamentals are boring, but we're going to keep finding uh, technology that makes them a little more engaging and fun and useful, particularly for younger generations. And uh, fintech is maybe the rapid regeneration is like not the, is like more palpable to the people in the industry versus the actual consumers, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. So let's bring us, that brings us to our next segment, deep dive. I want to talk more about green financing, what that means. Uh, So talk to me and talk to anyone that's listening, like they really don't know what that term even means. Sure. So green financing or climate finance or values aligned finance, they all kind of mean the same thing. Um, You know, when, when we talk about it and I talk about it at Green Portfolio, you know, we're focused on talking about it at like the consumer level or like personal finance level. So like what you, me, all of us can do, you know, with our money and your dollars don't sit idle, you know, when they're in the bank or um, based on how you invest your money, you know, you're, you're putting your money into funds or companies that are, you know, using your money to either make a product or, um, you know, support initiatives or development somewhere else. So 
your money has power uh, to really shift what's going on from a climate perspective too. So for example, like we can talk about banking first. So, you know, when you open up a bank account and you put your hard earned paycheck, you know, deposit that into your account, you know, your bank then is you know, your money is safe for, you know, when you need it, but they're using it to like loan out to different types of projects and different types of companies. Uh, some banks are using your money to loan it out to, you know, drill oil or, um, you know, build a pipeline, um, mm -hmm. really supporting fossil fuel expansion and exploration. Mm -hmm. Other banks are saying, we're not going to do that because we think that's actually a climate risk. Um, it could actually be risky for your financial situation and the world's. And we're going to start focusing on greener initiatives and on renewable energy. So mm -hmm. those banks could be putting your money uh, into, you know, building out wind farms, building out solar farms, um, potentially looking at ways and like battery storage. Like how, once we harness, you know, energy, yeah. how do we do that? Um, or even like some, you know, a lot of like credit unions and other like banks are even giving out, you know, loans to like you as individuals, if you want to, um, work on energy improvements, like for your home or, um, you know, solar loans or electric vehicle loans. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when I talk about banks, um, and greening your finances, there's a way where you don't really have to do anything with like the money that you're earning, except just decide where you want to put it. Right. Um, from a banking perspective. So you can put your your three to six months of, uh, uh, what is it? They kind of, it's your, your safety net, your regular savings, uh, three to six months of your expenses, wherever that cash sits. Mm -hmm. It could sit with a bank that is using that cash to fund solar farms, or you, it can sit with a bank that can fund oil and gas drilling. So how is Green Portfolio going to help the average kind of consumer investor, you know, figure that out for themselves? Yeah, I mean, well, we're going to be your your helper in and your sleuth, essentially. So your guide to figuring out what's, you know, what companies and funds from the investment side of things and like what banks are actually doing what they claim to be doing from a climate friendly or environmental perspective. Mm -hmm. Like it's. If anyone's tried to do this, and not everyone has, so it's fine if you haven't, but if you've tried to figure this out, like you're reading like annual reports that are like hundreds of pages long, or looking at different types of rating systems that are really unclear and like it's like black box, like this number where you don't know where anything's coming from. It's it's really hard to figure out what is misleading marketing, which is also called greenwashing, uh, right. or if it's something that's doing the right thing. So that's why we've you know, built green portfolio, we want to make it as easy for you as possible to align your climate goals and your financial goals. And so, you know, in terms of how we do that, we have product reviews, at least at the, the base level, where mm -hmm. we look at different banking options, um, different, you know, ETFs that, you know, maybe claim to be climate friendly or fossil fuel free. You know, we'll look at that and we'll, you know, assess pros and cons for you in terms of what those accounts and financial products are doing mm -hmm. uh, and give that information to you. To take it a step further, like our Climate Hub, which is launching in about a month, you know, actually would allow you to uh, sync up your accounts. So, you know, kind of what you do with, um, you know, what you do when you use Venmo, right? Like you like right. kind of give them access to like use your bank account. We're just going to not manage your money, but we'll see what you have, you know, in terms of your bank, your investment portfolio. And what we can do then is score that for you, um, show you the climate winners and losers, uh, and then provide you like a list of suggested, you know, greener alternatives that you could switch to depending on what you want to do with your money. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for that. Uh, I have not gone down the road of reading, you know, annual reports, uh, but it does get really confusing, particularly if you have money in stocks as well, because, you know, like you said, a company can greenwash so they can say that they're doing something that they're really not doing. Um, or they could just change their approach. For for instance, a headline two months ago was that BP is scaling back on their climate targets and 
concurrently, their profits are also hitting a record high. So it's it's very hard to, as a consumer, to be following each blip and change. Uh, so it sounds like Green Portfolio will kind of help us look at the big picture across our portfolio, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And you'll be able to you know, add things to a watch list. So if it's not mm-hmm. in your portfolio, we want to keep tabs on it. We'll help you do that. Um, we'll yeah. be able to send you, you know, key key alerts, right? Like not everything, mm-hmm. things that would actually maybe move the needle on, you know, good or bad climate activity at that company uh, or what's mm-hmm. involved in that fund, mm-hmm. and then tell you how that would translate, like you know, to your finances. Mm-hmm. Um, so I uh, I know one. Um, one bank that has a pretty has earned a pretty bad reputation is JP Morgan Chase. And I know I have accounts with them. And so will Green Portfolio remind me on a regular basis how important it is for me to make that change? Send, send me updates and headlines say like, Chase is doing this, you know, it's pre- we told you it's bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's getting yeah. Hard. I mean, so <laughs> I don't know. You guys want to ask? Yeah, there's a balance of like because we, you know, some of this we we want to make sure that you as an individual like are operating in like your own constraints and like what you can control, right? So we're not here to like pass blame or like judgment. It's mm-hmm. more like any any action you can take is a good action in this step towards like addressing climate change. At the end of the day, what we want to be doing is taking all of our individual actions. And, you know, since we'll have a bunch of people on the platform, be able to be like, you know, this is collective pressure. Like you, JP Morgan yeah. Chase, like a bunch of our users have accounts with you. Like if you like, you know, did something good, X percent would like keep their money with you. Mm-hmm. If you keep doing things that are bad. This is the amount of like, you know, money that you're going to lose from an investor yeah. perspective. And and um, just bank account perspective. And I think that's really what's lacking today is like the power of the individual consumer and like retail investor, because, you know, as one person, you can't compete with the pressure of like a government or like, you know, a big asset manager, like coming into a bank um, or a company to put pressure on someone. But like, that's what, you know, Bonnie and I, as like founders of Green Portfolio want to be able to do. We want to be that voice for like, everyone to be able to say like, this is not good or applaud when they call like main street investors. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people struggle on this continuum of like, on one end, I've heard women in line at the grocery store with the plastic bags and saying, you know, you're not going to guilt me into not using plastic bags when you large Fortune 50 company are dumping like oil in the water. Like, don't run a media campaign to manipulate me. Right. So that's one end of like uh, my tiny contributions mean jack shit compared to big contributions. And then there's, you know, people that are, you know, zero waste Mm -hmm. and just like going all in. Um, For those of us that are somewhere in between, where does like green financing, finance, greening our finances sit in terms of like impact? Like I'm going to make an effort. If I had a new year's resolution of like, one thing I can do to affect the climate, you know, green finance is uh, start composting and give up plastic straws. Like what is the thing that's really going to move the needle here? So what I like about greening your finances is it, it may sound cumbersome and daunting, but at the end of the day, if you just devote like a little bit of time to doing it, it's not something you have to think about 24 seven of every day with every choice, which I think is really important. Um, there's some research out of the UK, um, a nonprofit called Make My Money Matter ran a study and found that if you switch from like a regular, you know, UK has pension funds, right? Rather than more like retirement accounts. You switch your money from like a typical pension fund to a sustainable pension fund, you're actually, um, your money will actually be 21 times more impactful 
than doing a, a combination of like daily lifestyle activities combined. Like, you know, eating meat like only once a week, flying yeah. less, taking shorter showers. Like there's a lot of different things they looked at. And so when you add up all of like the mental time um, that like stresses people out and like overloads people, like shifting the money is really powerful. And right. then from like a corporate perspective, like we, we are like, we're in a capitalist like society at this point, like money talks. And so mm -hmm. if you start either becoming an active shareholder and like voice it, using your voice or, you know, divesting and we can capture that and aggregate that and show how that's shifting um, or just like stop buying a brand because you don't like what they're doing. You know, all of that is stuff that once we start to build pressure, like at a larger level, like corporations will take into account. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and they are right now just in the court of public opinion, but that court is not as strong as the court of nickels, dimes, quarters, dollars. Exactly. Like, I think right? like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's some stuff coming out of like, you know, research papers like coming out of Germany too that show that when corporations or funds like have that pressure, they actually will reduce their emissions over like a five year span. Whereas if like a corporation has no pressure at all, that corporation increases. Yeah. Um, so, so it is something that works. It's just something that, you know, I see like green portfolio being the one that can like lead the charge and like take some of that pressure off of people. So if you like do the right thing, then we can like, use that effort to make a bigger shift? Well, what I find exciting about it is twofold. One, for anyone that has uh, had a hard time, um, and there's a lot of us, to like change a lot of our habits to be zero waste or low waste. You know, I'm not rolling my eyes at those things. I do the, do some of those things too, but it's hard to change our habits. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is that like, if I spent an hour or two every quarter updating my financial portfolio, which I do anyway to like balance my checkbook basically and, and update my, my savings and budget. Uh, this extra step of, of greening my finances, increasing my climate score within green portfolio, that actually is more impactful for our planet than me learning to carry around reusable straws in my bag. Yeah, that's exactly right. And yeah, no, if you want to use reusable straws and like I compost too, like, you know, it's all these things are good. Um, it's just, if you really want to get like a bang for your buck, like take a look at your finances. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And I like how it, it doesn't necessarily contradict the trend of, you know, fin finances becoming boring again, like tried and true principles. You can still very much be a, a capitalist and invest your money in growth uh, areas without, while also making sure that the holding companies holding those, that money are greener than yeah. others. Exactly. And like, you know, depending on what you can do with your money, you know, publicly traded stocks and funds, it's kind of what we're focusing on right now, but like climate tech investing, you know, and if you can do like crowd investing, you know, there's different platforms to do that that are focused on like climate focused companies is having a real boom right now. Um, just because of the government funding that's going into that space, um, you know, the need and awareness that there needs to be more innovation um, mm -hmm. around like the climate industry. Um, yeah. just like another area that you know, kind of aligns with what you're talking about. And what we're talking about is like, you know, you can, you can look to make money in this. This is not just an altruistic endeavor. Oh, sure. I'm working, uh, on a, a project with an, a, another company and it, it led me to taking a, a, taking a side to look at, you know, what are the real financial, uh, returns on investment? when a company invests in sustainability measures, right? So whether they're facing government regulation or they need to mitigate risk or respond to like shareholder, stakeholder pressure, or customer demands, um, you know, a, a, for a company to pursue these things, it's not, all, it's, it's includes long-term business re resilience, right? You know, cause this is happening whether we like it or not, right? Um, 
driving innovation, identifying new revenue streams, maybe reducing costs. Uh, so we want to support companies that are committed to doing things like that because it also is good business, right? Yep. Yeah, totally. Cool. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, uh, taking a different vantage point of, you know, you as a person, I'm going to do the last segment, which is who needs a safety net anyway? <laughs> In this segment, I asked my guests to share a story of risk, failing upwards, and the learning lessons that come with that as an entrepreneur and innovator. So, Elizabeth, tell me a story. Tell us all a story <laughs> about, you know, a big risk and whether a safety net really matters. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's a fun question. I got I got to listen to your other answers from other founders and entrepreneurs <laughs> on this one. It's always good. I think, you know, I I feel like I've always been like a calculated risk taker. Um and I've done that with my career in general. So like, I think the biggest one was like, you know, not really having a safety net was probably when I became a founder. Mm -hmm. um, it was back in 2020. Um, so I was actually coming back to a startup I was working at, like off maternity leave, coming back, coming back virtually because we were in the height of like this new thing called COVID. Uh, and I realized like, what am I doing? Like I... <laughs> I'm not passionate about the brand I'm working on. Like I'm working for like some not great people who really value my expertise. Like maybe it's time for me to peace out. Mm -hmm. And so I gave my, made sure my team was okay and they were fine. Um, yeah. But, you know, gave my two weeks and just like, I'm just going to take an extended maternity leave. Like we'll see what happens, which led me to like the greatest job I've had so far, which has been co-founder with Bonnie uh, Gurry at Green Portfolio. Um, and now like I get to wake up every morning to focus on, you know, not only like something I care about from a personal perspective, but also think it's really important in my profession. So yeah. I don't have to doom scroll anymore. <laughs> like I just wake up and I'm like, I'm going to focus on trying to fix this problem in any way I can and help people do it. And yeah. it feels really great. Um, and I can kind of like think about this now, like I track this back throughout my career. I've, I've done this whole, like, I know what my plan is in terms of finding like a new job, but I don't have anything lined up. So the first time I did this, first time I did this was probably 2016. Um, I've been working at a company for a really long time. Um, they like, I started with them out of college and like was on a great trajectory there, but you know, it was B2B, so business to business focused. Um, I really wanted to get more in touch with like consumers and people and like what makes them tick. And so, you know, it just wasn't necessarily the right fit anymore. Um, so I ended up leaving there, not knowing where I was going, um, but with an MBA in hand um, mm -hmm. and eventually landed at like a large, like consumer facing, like, you know, alcohol, like, you know, beer brand. <laughs> Totally. Um, totally different. Oh, not really. Chemi so chemical engineering is my profession. I work for a chemical <laughs> company. I understand how you make beer because I'm a chemical engineer. <laughs> and I worked on the brand side, right? Brand innovation, consumer insights, all of that yeah. was really what I, and I loved that. Um, right. I loved learning how people tick and what I can do to help bring something to them that they don't really even know they want for that point in time. That was really yeah. great. Um, but That's also, a cool transition from chemical yeah. engineering to uh, brand like that. That seems like a really big leap. Um, so wait, so when you kind of came back from maternity leave and it's COVID, I guess, and you didn't know, you didn't know what you were going to do after you gave your two weeks. No, no. Like, I no idea. Is there any oh shit? moment oh yeah at all. <laughs> it, like before you even like reconnected with bonnie talked about green portfolio was there like was it like oh i just did that no, yeah I, I mean there's always there's always a little bit of that i the first time i did it like back in 2016 was definitely the hardest because like yeah. i was i was younger so like just not as seasoned and like knowing what would happen with like my professional career trajectory. 
Um, it go it went against everything like I've been told. In Every of, like, rule you've ever been told. Right? <laughs> it's easier to find um, a job when you have a job. And, yeah. Like, but then, like, I mean, I ended up doing it again when um, I left the beer company I was working at. Yeah. Um, and so it gets easier every time you do it. The key is to <laughs> have, like, I, I, I knew what I didn't like. So that was like always a learning. I knew what I was looking for in terms of like size of company mm-hmm. and like what I wanted to do with like my skill set. So I think the key is like kind of like calculated risk taking and like you obviously have to know what your tolerance is. Right. But I, I, I knew that when I left the startup after like maternity leave that I would be looking for like a smaller company. I still like that startup world, but like smaller Mm -hmm. company, like more collaborative culture, something mission oriented. And like, I don't think at that point in time when I left though, I was like, I'm going to be a founder. Like I I knew that that was in me. Mm -hmm. I knew though that I wanted, I would never be a solo founder. Like I like, um, that collaboration and being able to bounce things off of somebody. But I also know it's really hard to find that relationship. Right. Um, and so then when, um, you know, when Bonnie, like my co-founder, you know, she had already started working on Green Portfolio and came to me about this. And um, it just, we, we kind of did a 12 week trial period together and like never looked back. And yeah, yeah the, the trust and the communication since we've known each other for a while it was there. Which really what helps. I think I'm hearing is, um, well, one, um, similar to any activity that scares you, whether it's a roller coaster, you know, jumping out of an airplane, you know, the first time you do it, really scary. The second time you do it, less scary, right? Um, so it sounds like actually in kind of your entrepreneur origin story, um, there really, it didn't feel very, it didn't feel like there was in a moment where you were like, I'm taking a big risk and going to put my confidence cape on and face my fears. I think a lot of people imagine the day they decide to be an entrepreneur is, is like that. And there, it doesn't sound like you had like a day where. No. And, like, and you, and you second guess yourself constantly, right? Like right. that first time I did it, like I was leaving something where I knew I could be successful. To, mm-hmm. but it wasn't what I wanted. Right. And, you know, that was like, am I going to regret this? And then you're applying to jobs. And obviously that's never fun, right? You get mm-hmm. same as when you're like pitching to investors, like you, you get a lot of no's, then you get your yes. And like, it all makes sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, your self-confidence is always wavering a bit because like, well, yeah. do the right thing. But ultimately, like, if you kind of keep to your top, like goals of why you did it, and like your convictions around why you did it, like it, it works out. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't feel as risky because there's a part of you that is like, one, you hold the confidence that you can do this thing. And, and two, there's, there's some sense of it feeling like, right. Yeah. You know, like just feeling like it's a right step to do this. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, cool. Totally. Awesome. Well, um, before we wrap up, uh, where can people find you online? So you can find me uh, on LinkedIn, uh, mm-hmm. Elizabeth Coley Landau. Um, mm-hmm. You can find uh, Green Portfolio at greenportfolio.com. Uh, also on TikTok, Green mm-hmm. Portfolio, and on Instagram, Green Portfolio yeah. underscore. Underscore, right. Cool. And like, if people want to start using green portfolio, they want to, they want to, um, green their finances, what, what should they do? So I'd recommend just going to our website, um, greenportfolio.com. Uh, the first thing you'll see is a place to sign up for, uh, our wait list. So mm-hmm. plug your email in there. Uh, we'll, we'll get you, uh, signed up once you're ready to launch in about a month. Yeah. And I would say also just check out our blog. Uh, we're always trying to stay up to date on things that are happening in greening your finances and climate fintech that could be useful for you. So right. it's a good place to, if you're not as familiar with this, like a good place to start in terms of like mm-hmm. learning what to look for. Yeah. Sounds like there's a ton of, ton of ways that people can get involved helping you as you're an early stage startup. Start by joining the the 
waitlist. You'll hear from Green Portfolio. They're launching something you said maybe in the next month. Um, definitely be looking for beta testers for sure. So if this is something you're super passionate about, reach out to uh, Elizabeth and Bonnie at Green Portfolio. So uh, let's make it all make sense when it comes to greening your finances and fintech. I mean, Fintech hopefully will make financials a little more interesting or we won't even notice it at all. I mean, financial principles, solid ones or the sound ones are always going to exist, but there's better ways for us to use our money to affect climate change. So maybe we don't have to uh, carry around straws anymore. Can. <laughs> If we put our money in the right places. So thank you for listening to Make Sense with me, your host, Lindsay Tabus, and guest Elizabeth Landau from Green Portfolio. We hope you enjoyed our take on everything climate tech and fintech. And if you want to continue to be the smartest person in the room, hit the subscribe for next week's episode. Um, we're in the early days still with this, and every subscriber on these platforms, specifically YouTube, makes a huge difference. You can get all of the links and resources in the show notes. And that's all for this episode. Catch up with you next time. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining me. Thanks.